We're going to open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, right? That I surrender everything I am to everything you are, Father. That you would speak from your heart through my mouth to the hearts and minds of your people tonight, Father. For you have a message for your child tonight. And Father, we thank you that you are the teacher. We give you all glory, honor, praise, and thanksgiving in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about um, some of the things that you're going to need to know as the Lord starts raising you up. For one, we are a soul in a body. And King David says that he restoreth my soul that I might walk in paths of righteousness. So as you start um, getting into not only your own healing, but ready to start ministering healing to other people, you're going to find hurting people. And when, you might have already experienced this, but hurting people hurt people. So there's going to be two types of people. You're going to find the hurting people as a victim, but you're also going to find people that hurt people. Because hurting people really do hurt people. When healed people don't hurt people. Healed people are nice people. But hurting people, wounded people, have you ever seen a dog that's been hit by a car and you go to try to help that dog? And you're trying to help that dog and it, and it comes out at you and it, 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 it's angry at you because it's hurting. And many times you're going to experience that um, people have been wounded by hurt people. And so one of the things that when you come into ministry, you're going to find people come into your office that's going to be in sin. And when you start counseling, and you might not even have an office, it might be your neighbor, it might be other people, but what I've learned with counseling is when people start telling you their stuff, you don't have to bring condemnation on them. You listen to what they're going through without going, oh, you did that? Oh my gosh, what a sinner you are. We don't, you know, when you're ministering to people and they're starting to tell you their most intimate stuff, it's important how you handle what they're telling you. And so as they're revealing things that's happened, it, it's embarrassing. Have you guys ever had to open up to people and start confessing stuff that you've done? You know, I've had people that's come from prison that's been in gangs. And, and it's like, I don't even want to tell you the stuff I've been involved with. But, you know, as things get exposed, you can get behind the hurt and pain of that situation. You can minister deeper to them if they feel comfortable enough to open up. So how you handle what they're telling you by not being shocked and not, you know, overreacting because you're wanting them to be able to talk. It's, have you ever guys just talked and got stuff off your chest? Sometimes just talking and allowing people to talk. Have you guys ever, have, who's been in my office? <laughs> so by coming in and just talking, has that helped you at all? Just by being exposed to the Holy Spirit, it's amazing to me that some people sit there and they start talking. It's like the Holy Spirit just starts downloading and, and starts healing areas, and I don't even have to do any work. <laughs> but there's times where just getting it out in the open is so important. So you want to be careful how you handle people because it's not your responsibility to convict of sin. It's not your responsibility to put condemnation on people. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings conviction. He doesn't bring condemnation. 
He doesn't bring condemnation. He brings conviction. Have you ever been convicted of your sin? Pastor Rainer, the Holy Spirit's showing you things. <laughs> Big signs at the restaurant. <laughs> And so what happens is it, it brings up and it brings conviction. So it's not your responsibility. That's the Holy Spirit's responsibility. It, it's important, though, when sin gets exposed and things gets exposed, that we can bring people to a place of repentance. And the reason we need to bring people to a place of repentance, not to bring more condemnation on that sin. A lot of times people have already repented over and over and over and over and over. It's like they beat themselves up for the sin they committed. But you're taking the power away from the enemy when you start, when you get them to repent. You might even have them repent of their parents' sins. As we go on, I'm going to give you more prayers and teach you how to do this. But repentance and renouncing and breaking something you're breaking if, if a man comes in with pornography issues that that's an area that we're going to have to deal with because that's a bondage sin is missing the mark from where god wants you to go and so i'm not going to beat the man up we're going to help get him free amen because he's in a, a bondage place in this sin, so he needs to repent of that, renounce it, break its power, so we can make the demon behind that sin leave. Amen? So that's going to be one of the things that you're going to work on. But everything that we do, you have to understand, is done in love. There can't be judgment. There can't be criticalness. There can't be all these things where you're beating people up and, and some temperaments are stronger wills than others and it's like, well, I told you to do this. You better do it. Pull yourself up by the bootstrap. It has to be done with love and compassion. That everything the Father does is done in love. And we're no better. The only reason we're where we're at is because the Holy Spirit has us here. We're here because the power of the Lord, he's healing us, he's delivering us, he's sanctifying us, and it's by his power that we're here. When you read my book, my testimony, I was in so much sin it, because I was hurting, I was trying to find love. And when you're hurting and you're trying to find love, the enemy lies to you. And so we, everything we do is wrapped in love because Satan wants to withhold love from people. When he wounds the heart, when he brings rejection and abandonment, he puts walls around our heart to withhold love from us. And if we don't have love, we can't minister that love. That's why getting our hearts healed and getting rid of rejection and abandonment is so important for us. Amen? Because if you don't have love, you can't give love. If, if I want to write you a check for $100, guess what I have to have in my bank account? At least $100, right? So if I want to write, give you love, love has to be in here. Because if I don't have love in here, and if I only have rejection and abandonment, if I have anger, if I have bitterness, if I have hatred, if I have, you know, murder and, and death and Hades and suicide, it, 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 strife and division, proud argument, pride, that's all I'm going to be able to give you because that's in my bank account. And so many times we go to people looking for love and we get rejected. We get hurt, we get wounded, because all that's in their bank account is emptiness, hurt and pain, rejection and abandonment. So what are they giving us out of their bank account? Because that's all they have in their account. So how do we get this love that we have to give out? 
First, we have to be healed. We have to be healed. We have to have all those layers, that onion, healed in every layer. And then God can give us love that no man can give us. And I remember looking for this love and looking for it in all the wrong places. And when you read my book, you're going to see I've been through a lot. And in my second marriage, I was pregnant. By the way, this is my third marriage, for all of you that don't know. And my wonderful husband, my Boaz, is back there. 29 years we're going to be married in April. Best friends. But I remember laying on my bed, and, and I go, oh, my God, what have I done? This man's not going to give me what I need. And I was panicked. Here I've got, you know, two of his children, one. Mine I brought in the marriage, and we're having two more together, and I'm on my last one with him, five kids at 26 years old. And this isn't it. What have I done? And I panicked. And God said, no man can meet your need. But I can meet your need. And he, he had me sit down, and he said, I'm going to pour love into you that you're going to have so much love you can give it out and never have to worry about getting it back. How often do we have love with condition? Well, I love you, but you better do something back for me. You better give me love back because I'm going to give you love. But can you imagine writing $100 checks all day long and never expecting anybody to pay it back to you? Because you have so much money in your account that you don't have to worry about a $100 check. It would just be easy to write $100 to hundreds of people and never worry about if they paid it back or not. Now, if you find somebody that has poverty and lack and they're hurting really bad for finances, if they write you a check for $100, they're going to be calling you the next day and go, you got to give it back to me. i got to pay my bills. I, I need to put that back in my account. I need you. Where are you? When are you going to give me that money? Is it true? Because they have lack. But if they're really rich, they can write that check for 100 and never even think twice about it. It's like a dollar, like 10 cents. That's the kind of love that God wants us to operate in. That it's not, it's called Hesed love. And it's covenantial love. It's love without strings. It's, I can love you even while you're going through your mess. Now, how many of you have ever been a parent? So if your child poops and throws up on you when they're a month old, are you going to be upset with them? You're going to love them because why? The poor baby. Oh my gosh, why did you throw up? You must be sick. You had diarrhea, it went all over my clothes. Now I gotta go change clothes. But you're not gonna throw the baby out. You're not gonna be mad at the baby. You're not gonna be upset with that child. But when you're ministering, you're gonna have babies throw up on you. Spiritual babies. You're gonna have them have diarrhea all over. And you're gonna love them unconditionally through that season of time of their spiritual walk without requiring anything else from them. They don't have to give you money. You're not here to get paid. God said freely give. If you freely received, freely give. I remember when this came on my life and people were getting healed and delivered. It's like, man, I'm going to go get myself a degree and I'm going to hang up a shingle and I'm going to make a lot of money. This stuff's great. And God said, no, you're not. This is for the body of Christ. And if you go out and get a degree and you hang up a shingle and you open up a, a Christian counseling office or counseling office, you're going to have everybody come in. It's not for everybody. It's not for the world. This is for the bride of Christ and only for the bride of Christ. He's washing. He's healing. He's restoring. He's sanctifying. This is for his bride to prepare her for the second coming. This is bigger than just some psychobabble. This is to restore the soul 
of his bride. And it has to be done in love. It has to be with compassion. That the, Yeshua said he had compassion and he healed. He had compassion and he healed. He had compassion and he healed. How do we get this compassion? We pray for it. How do we get this love? We pray for it. What's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Long-suffering, tender mercy, kindness, joy, gentleness. We need the fruit of the Holy Spirit for this anointing. Because you can't go and demand people to be more mature than what they are. A five-year-old cannot be 50. Now listen to me. A five-year-old cannot be 50. What do I mean by that? A baby believer, someone broken and wounded, cannot be a mature believer. They can only be as mature as they are at that moment in time. And by expecting them to be 50, they're not going to get it there. And I've seen people hurt and wound people by getting mad at people by not being completely free in one session. Our ministry is a ministry of restoration. Yeah, we teach the Jewish roots, but it's a ministry of restoration. It's built on Isaiah 61. And people come to that altar and they get prayed for, they cry, they get under the anointing, they get ministered to, and the next week they might be back at that altar. And the next week they might be back at that altar. And the next week they might be back at that altar. And the next week, and the next week, and the next week. And, you know, I've heard people come in with, with judgmental spirits and say, why, well, you must not have prayed right. You know, why would that person come up again? How come they're up there again? That altar is open for the move of the Holy Spirit to touch his people. And I, we cannot judge and be angry or be critical of people going up every week because our sister Carolyn talked about it being an onion. God is not going to heal us all at one time because it is too hard. It, in my book, it took at least 10 years, and I was angry at the last thing. It's like, are you kidding me? One more thing? Why didn't you do it back there all at once? And God said, you cried for 45 minutes, sobbed over that one thing. You couldn't have done it all at one time. Your heart would have broken. It would have exploded. He's gentle. He's sweet. He goes one layer at a time. And we can't walk in judgment or criticalness or demand or, well, you must not have read the Bible long enough. You better go and pray longer. Because you should have been healed by now. That's not our responsibility, precious ones. We need to walk with them through their journey with unconditional love. And you know what? They might go away from you for a couple of years, and you might get another phone call. And they might need to come back. But it's not for you to even hold on to them. Their journey is their journey. You just have the privilege, and let me tell you, it's a privilege to allow for the Holy Spirit to allow you in the very soul of man in his throne room with him. This is a privilege that, like no other, when your daddy is restoring someone and you get the privilege to be an instrument of his Holy Spirit. It is a privilege, and we can't ever take that lightly. So it has to be restored in love. Everything that you do has to have love. How many of you have ever felt that love when you come into the ministry? That unconditional love. And it, it, we can't, the people don't belong to us. It's kingdom work. We can't put boundaries on them. Well, if you don't come to my church, then you know what? Forget it. And if you don't stay here all the time, then forget it. 
These are God's people. It's the kingdom work we're doing. It's not, I'm not building my kingdom. I get the privilege to work in his kingdom. And it's a real privilege. Amen? I'm going to pick up where uh, Mary left off, if that's okay with you guys. Because it was a real privilege to get to minister to her and her husband, Art. And God has done an amazing thing with our relationship. In fact, um, how many years ago was it that you came, Mary? Twelve years ago, she had a little girl that was kind of rebellious. And this little girl sat in the back when this church opened up eight years ago. And she would sit on the back pew and give Reverend Ben and her stepdad a hard time. And they'd try to corral her in and corral my daughter in. And um, finally, one day, this little girl comes up to me. She says, I'd like to be on your praise and worship team. I go, you sing? And she goes, yeah, I sing and I play guitar too. And she stepped up, and this girl has a voice that you wouldn't believe, and the gift of guitar, and just amazing. So she was on praise and worship team, and my grandson was um, a very messed up young man, a, a very broken young man. He was into drugs, and he had really messed his life up. He didn't finish high school at the time, and he had got a ticket for driving without a license. And it's almost like our jail systems are... are, are system, our court systems, almost makes it where you can never get out of it. And they put a high penalty on him, and he had to go to classes, and he couldn't afford it. They moved out to Rancho from the area where he was going to class. He had no ride to get to class. He had no money to pay for the class, and he was just a mess. And God had us just kind of love on him and minister to him and bring him into our home. And my precious husband, paid for the class and drove him to class and then got him through the court system to get his license and then he finally got a part-time job and we were driving him back and forth to his job getting up at four in the morning and you know really loving him right where he was at and he got his act together he became saved and he got off drugs and we helped him get a car and he started working at a better job and he proposed to their daughter. Now, her daughter is married to my grandson, and we're expecting our first great-grandbaby through that um, union. And it, it's amazing what the Lord has done. Um, so our Justin, he got healed, and he's just doing amazing. He's he's amazing husband. He is just an amazing husband. And her daughter is an amazing granddaughter, and we're so proud and pleased to have her as part of our family. But Art and Mary came to the ministry, and like she said, they weren't even living together. They couldn't even live in the same house. They were texting one another, and um, he told her not to cry, not to tell anybody, and they would show up, and nobody knew the problems they were having, but to find out they had gone to several secular counselors, several counseling sessions and every time they would go in and sit down she would start crying and the counselor would look at him and say you're a jerk you're mean you're rotten and he would get up and walk out and he would spend about five minutes there and they would point the finger because she was a victim and they would point the finger at him and he would get up and walk out and how many counselors maybe six seven eight one counselor christian counseling gave up on you completely um they came into my office and sat down, and I said, your problem isn't your issue today. Your problem has to do with your yesterdays, what the baggage you brought into this marriage. And Art looks at Mary and says, I told you. <laughs> our problem is not the problem today. It's our past problems. And that opened him up, and he stayed in the counseling and we found that there was much hurt and pain from both of them in their past. There was even demonic activity of curses, satanic curses, and things that we found by exploring this with the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we took them through separate inner healing and breaking curses off of them, 
can, can I give more testimonies? Okay. Um, Precious Mary, her first husband died when her children were very, very young. Her mother-in-law, her ex-mother-in-law, is into uh, Santa Rita. I don't want, I can never pronounce these words. And it's, it's a witchcraft. And she was actually putting curses on Mary's husband because she was upset that Mary remarried. And she had pictures of him. And so on their honeymoon is when the problem started. As soon as they went away on their honeymoon, they started arguing. It was strife and division so big and so strong, but there was witchcraft curses placed on this marriage. And secular counseling could not have detected that kind of a thing. Do you understand? And so we see that as we discovered the hurts and pains of each of their past, as we dealt with their pains and the curses that was on them, God healed their marriage. And they moved back in together. They bought a house together. Um, it's amazing, the miracle of this marriage. But it goes into inner healing and deliverance. There's pus pockets that, as you read in my book, there's a pus pocket that gets tapped into that you get emotional over and you don't even necessarily remember what happened back here, but you have a lot of emotions. When there's a lot of anger, a lot of pain, um, one of the stories in my book on pus pockets is, I was pregnant, married to my wonderful husband, Reverend Ben, and I got pregnant by a miracle. We couldn't get pregnant. We went through a process. This baby's a miracle. I'm very pregnant, very fat. Decided to um, kind of watch what I was eating, ate fruit instead of, you know, high fat stuff. And one day I went to the refrigerator and got fruit out of the refrigerator. And Reverend Bing came and he goes, what are you eating? I go, grapes, would you like some? He goes, no, not now. You didn't ask me. And I was wounded, and I was hurt, and I was angry, and so he's teaching me how to communicate. So I go back to him, and I say, you know, you didn't talk to me very nice. That wasn't fair. You, you know, you need to talk nicer to me. And he goes, well, what do you think? I give you money, and you, you guys buy everything good in this house, and I don't get anything good. And, you know, I give you money for groceries, and you don't give me anything good. And I'm thinking, that's a lie. Now I'm really mad. Now I don't know about any of you guys, but things go through my mind. And I waddle my body up those stairs, and I am just like out here, and I'm going to go get myself a job tomorrow. I am moving out. I'm not taking another penny. How dare him talk to me this way? And I am just furious, and I am angry, and I'm... <sighs> Have you guys ever got so angry? <laughs> and I go upstairs and I'm just stomping and I'm mad and I'm moving out tomorrow. And I go, God, where is all this coming from? God quickly takes me back to a situation in my own family where my mom is standing over us. We were poor. My parents were alcoholics. There was no money for food. There was a little bag of potato chips, and us kids are just eating it as fast as we could because we never got anything like that. And my mom screaming and yelling, you pigs, you eat everything in this house. Almost the same words that my husband spoke to me. I broke, I cried for 45 minutes. I didn't remember the emotions of that scene. I, I, I couldn't remember I, when I pictured it. I couldn't see how I felt, but I saw the visual of that moment. And all of this emotion, I cried. And God showed me why I was so wounded by my husband. Do you guys understand what I'm telling you? It was gone. The anger was completely gone. I went down the next morning and I told Reverend Ben, I go, this is what happened last night. He, of course, hugged me and he goes, sweetheart, I didn't know it was that bad. I knew your life was bad, but I didn't know it was that bad. 
Now, my husband's love language is acts of service. And hopefully I'm going to be able to teach, if you guys go through all three modules, I'm going to teach you love language and temperaments and a lot more things. But his love language is acts of service. And his mother would put food aside just for him. This is for my son. And, and keep it just for him. So when I didn't offer him food, he felt rejected. Do you guys see how this is working? So because he felt rejected, he was wounded. Because he was wounded, he talked sarcastically to me. And it touched my pus pocket. And I told him, I go, this is why people get divorced. And you know, God relieved me when he showed me where that visual had come from. He relieved the pain. And so there's pus pockets that we can experience that causes us to get angry. And when there's emotion going on, when you get to that point of anger or you're just so upset with somebody, is there pain behind it? Because usually there is. And we don't necessarily know how other people were raised. Now, how many of you have been through some stuff in your childhood? Do you know, as Mary came in to the office, she wanted to point the finger at her husband. And the Lord years ago told me to get the board out of my own eye before I got the speck out of somebody else's. Because many times the, the hard trial you're going through is pressing in on those pus pockets. The Lord showed me, you know, at first I thought, oh, the demons are attacking me. Sometimes God allows pressure to come in to point out pus pockets. But it's so easy now, if I would have never asked God where that was coming from, I could have probably filed for divorce. Can you imagine the enemy, what he would have loved for my husband and I to be divorced? Because none of this would be here today. None of it. He could have used a pus pocket to wound me and me blame him for the way he talked to me. But God used that to bring up that pus pocket for me to be healed. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose and plan. Amen. So inner healing does not erase the memory, but it relieves the pain. Inner healing does not erase the memory. Because it's important that you remember what you went through. That's your testimony. Do you know how many people come into my office and I'm sitting behind my desk with all my, you know, Dr. Patricia now and and I'm sitting in nice clothes, and I'm looking pretty good, and they come in, and it's like, I don't want to talk to you. And sometimes I go, let me just give you five minutes of my testimony. And as I just share with them a little bit of what I've been through, the wall comes down. The wall comes down. Because they know I'm not going to judge them. And, and it's easier to, to sit and share what they've been through. Yeah, I was molested. Yeah, I was abused. I, my, my family was alcoholic. There was a lot of shame on my life. Because, you know, when you, when you know that people have been through something, it's a little bit easier to trust them. It's a little bit easier to share your stuff, is it not? Because you feel safe in some way. They can understand. So God isn't going to erase the memory of what you've been through. He's going to use that and he's going to bring people to you at what you've been through. Once he heals you and delivers you, he's not going to erase the memory, but he's going to deal with the pain. But then you're going to have testimony from what you've been through and I almost can guarantee you those will be the people that come to you that you're going to be able to minister to. 
If you had problems in marriage, sometimes God's going to do a great work and, and restore that, and sometimes not. He didn't restore my first marriage or my second marriage. And I really thought that I couldn't get a divorce because I was a Christian. And oh my gosh. But you know, God spoke to me and said, I never put you in that marriage. You put yourself there. But I've also seen him heal marriages that should never be healed. Marriages where there was infidelity and, and such hurt and such pain. I've seen him heal that. I've seen him heal people that, that you would think it's just impossible. I've even seen him, and we're going to get later on in, in your book, where people are multiple personalities because of satanic ritual abuse or because such abuse has happened. And God has even healed that. It's amazing. But you know, he's going to heal you, and then you're going to minister in those areas where he's healed you. Because people are going to be brought to you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Satan doesn't get to win. Satan doesn't get to win. God turns all things around for his glory. No weapon formed against you is going to prosper. That there is going to be a miracle in your life. And then he's going to glorify his name. I love what Isaiah 61 says. He's going to make you a tree of righteousness for his namesake. And all the hell you're going through, you're going to learn to press into him and trust him. Because Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Cursed is the man who puts his trust in man. And then I'm going to paraphrase it. You're going to be like a shrub out in the wilderness. Because when your trust is in man and you take God off the throne of your heart, you put man on the throne of your heart, you're going to be like a tumbleweed. You're going to be blown all over emotionally. But the word goes on to say, but blessed is the man who puts his trust in God, in the Lord, because you're going to become a tree with deep roots in living water. And then you're going to always bear fruit. And your leaves will not grow brown even in drought. So the fruit you're going to bear is what's going to nourish people when they come to eat from your tree because God's going to make you a tree of righteousness. Amen. I'm going to close in prayer, then I'm going to give you your homework. Heavenly Father, we just thank you right now. Father, we thank you that as our past hurts and pains, Father, is garbage for the demons. Father, you go in and you heal, you deliver, you sanctify, you transform. For Isaiah 61 says you come to bind up the broken heart to set the captives free. So, Father, we thank you that you're not only healing us, but you're giving us a testimony. You're turning it around, Father, for your glory. You're making us trees of righteousness for your name's sake. Father, we give you glory, honor, praise, and thanksgiving for no weapon formed against us will prosper. No weapon formed against us will prosper. You're causing our roots to go deep in living water, that we will bear great fruit for your kingdom, the fruit of Canaan, Father, that it will be sweet and it will be nourishing to other people. We give you honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving in Yeshua's holy name. Amen.